go forward. Okay, um, let's invite our next speaker. It's uh, Luis Diego uh, Quiros uh, uh, Pacheco. Um, he is from uh, South America. I think it's great that we have some representatives here from South America. Um, um, not, not sure whether uh, Luis uh, is, is involved in the CTPUH yet. He is a, um, an assistant professor uh, at the School of Architecture, uh, Planning and Preservation at the University of Maryland, USA. Um, um, he he uh, has graduated from uh, the Universidad del Desino and uh, Kansas State University where he also taught as a graduate instructor. Quiros has been a professor at the thesis studio at the University of Desino and participated and taught at courses such as Architectural Association, uh, Associations Visiting Teachers Program 204 and Harvard uh, uh, joint Studio 208. Um, and his focus in La Latin America is uh, about uh, urban developments, uh, bioclimatic design, and uh, on um, century experience of architecture. Um, um, uh, um, so I think uh, let, let's, welcome, uh, let's welcome Louis and, and hear what he's got to say about tall buildings. Thank you. Uh, so good morning everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, this has been a great experience and I'm really uh, happy to be able to share part of the research that uh, we're doing at the uh, University of Maryland. This is a, a continuing uh, interest of mine, which is um, the urban habitat in Latin America and how it uh, relates to verticality. And I talk about verticality because um, there, there are specific situations in each part of the world that dictate how tall we build and the reasons, as we just saw in Robert's um, presentation, the reasons are, are, are very much different uh, for each of these regions. And so we need to understand this. And um, again, this has been my, my interest for a while. Together with that, uh, I'm interested in informality, which is one of the biggest issues in Latin American urbanism. How do we deal with the informality of the city? And so what I will try to do here in this presentation is tie them a little bit and explore some possibilities. Uh, and again, this is a continuing uh, research project at the university. So I'm a big and firm believer in that uh, the city and its inhabitants are in a perpetual state of exchange. We are... Um, changed by our, by our environment, and we change it. This is not something, uh, this is not a relationship that is stable, and it completely changed, and we need to think critically about these things. We cannot just sit there and wait to see what happens. And so what I'm trying to do here is um, criticize, or, or again, think critically about these structures that really cannot sustain our actual conditions. Uh, we're very familiar with the example of the Prit Ego, um, but also with uh, this kind of infrastructure. What is the future of the city and how we're thinking about it, uh, it's important. So a little bit of uh, background on Latin America for those of you who are not as familiar. Uh, we have a, a, a population growth, just like the rest of the world, is not as uh, steep as in other parts, but we're getting there. <laughs> we're, uh, we're reproducing at a very fast pace, uh, but at the same time, we are not, um, using that much energy, although again, it has increased quite a bit, uh, but um, for example, uh, Bolivia, Brazil, and Colombia, uh, these guys, people are coming to the cities. Uh, we have now a major population growth. Uh, you can see that in a few years, we're gonna be basically um, as urbanized as the United States, and that has had a, pow a powerful impact in, uh, in all of our cities. Uh, this is the graphic that I was referring before, that even though we're an urbanized area, the use of energy because of our climatic conditions um, and also because of um, other different social uh, and cultural um, uh, issues, we don't spend that much energy. So you can see down there, uh, Central and South America in comparison to other parts of the world. So the reasons for why building tall in Latin America uh, are very, very different. And I think one of them has to do with how these cities are growing. Uh, we're, you all are familiar with the idea of, of a mega city, but we only have four of them in Latin America. And uh, those are the cities that are growing in height. Uh, but the rest of the cities are also growing in people, but not really growing in height. And again, what that has caused 
is this migration into medium-sized cities with more than one million inhabitants or two million in some cases. And this is what we see. These are uh, what you call shanty towns or uh, favelas, or uh, uh, we call it uh, tugurios. Um, and so the question is, how are we going to deal with this in the future? Um, th I'm sorry. These are some of um, the data that we've collected um, about the situation. For example, we have very inefficient governments. It's really hard to deal with governmental institutions in Latin America, harder than in most other areas. Uh, again, this high level of informal housing. Um, but 48 of the urban workers are employed in the informal sector. That means that they don't pay taxes, uh, that it's really hard to uh, locate them, for example, uh, if you want to uh, tax them. Um, but also 37% of housing stock is inappropriate to afford protection against disaster. And that's because we're building in areas that we shouldn't be building. Um, areas that are prone to uh, inundations, to earthquakes, uh, mudslides, and, and so on. Um, even though we have a lot of shanty towns, a lot of these people actually own cars. And so the level of using private vehicles is increasing in many countries. Um, but also, uh, some of the future trends is that we're looking at larger populations, but birth dates, uh, birth birth rates are decreasing, and this is a universal trend. So what that means um, is that we have a larger, uh, what we call Generation X, which is marrying later, which is having less kids, and which prefer urban living. So uh, this is starts establishing the, that cultural trend uh, that is specific to the area. Uh, some of the cities deal with uh, broken topographies. We just uh, saw the location uh, of Latin America in regards to the, um, the plates, uh, and uh, we're no exception. Uh, there's tons of earthquakes. Uh, and then there is this perception that we have a, a cultural aversion to verticality. Um, and that's why cities don't really grow. We have, um, it's a little bit of that American dream of living in the suburbs, having a, a, a patio where you can go and enjoy the weather, but it's also uh, that we might not be ready. And so this is, because again, my background is a little bit on human behavior, um, I'm interested in how to create and sort of deal with this component of our culture. Uh, one of the things that uh, informal living causes it was, is what the, uh, the less called de-territorialization, de uh, de which is the weakening of ties between culture and place. And uh, through the city, we actually start tying these two back together. If we expand, that's uh, something different. So the question in this moment is, what are we becoming? What is Latin America becoming and what are we doing on this, especially when in the future we're looking at uh, emerging markets, um, such as some of, of our countries, uh, where 100% of the infrastructure construction growth is going to happen there. Uh, and again, this, this says a lot about the way that we grow. Um, so as part of this, we have started looking at some urban interventions in the area. So what are governments doing uh, uh, to prevent or to deal with these situations? Um, and this is the most typical one. Uh, we see a lot of chanty towns. We uh, give them a piece of land. We build a house for them. We start the urban sprawl. Uh, this is very, very typical of a lot of the governments. Uh, this is an image from Costa Rica. But it basically increases mobility and maintenance costs for the government because there's a lot of infrastructure being built. But it also promotes individuality. Everybody has their own home. Uh, everybody, you don't, you don't even know who your neighbor is. You don't interact with them. You drive, uh, you take the car, you go to the city, you go do uh, your business and then come back. Um, on the other hand, we're uh, looking at worldwide uh, renowned interventions like the one in Curitiba, which is a very efficient transit system, which is great, but at the same time, what it's starting to do is that people are more and more dependent on these transit systems, which actually, uh, again, increase mobility and reduces uh, the time that we spend in the city. We're going back and forth, uh, moving uh, from home to work, but uh, it also incentivates the expansion of the city. 
uh, and in this uh, uh, and also increases the infrastructure, uh, not only of roads, but as you can see, uh, everything that has to do with the transportation system. It's not an underground uh, system, for example, uh, which would be more expensive, and that makes it a good solution for our region, but at the same time, it brings uh, some of these um, unforeseen costs. Uh, this is uh, Colombia, which some of the interventions that deal with uh, these favelas um, have been uh, thought in terms of vertical mobility. So that cultural uh, acceptance of verticality is starting to grow uh, in terms of how do we move. It's no longer on the roads or it's no longer walking, but we are dealing with a vertical uh, movement system that has been taken very well but at the same time has a lot of costs. And even though this is um, an, a, a not so expensive way of moving, it has its implications. So um, what they're doing in Colombia is they're building social projects like this library, which is a great building and establishes a point of interaction to people, but they're formalizing uh, basically the informal living. And this has an impact on our culture and how we go about it. Uh, this is the building, this is the library. They're calling some of the best architects in the region to, to do these projects, but at the same time, the consequences that come um, beyond this, I think, are important. So this is a very uh, usual view of the mountains in the city, but not because this is built here uh, and has a, a positive, what they call a positive social impact, uh, means that we should be building here. Uh, and these areas are prone to mudslides, uh, and we're investing a lot of the government's money in doing these kind of things. So in part, I think it's a political short-term decision, um, but also we need to, again, rethink about it. And here's, here's again, that image. So it, this increases mobility, incentivates expansion, uh, a little bit more of, of the same. This is the Cantagalo elevator in Brazil, a uh, huge structure. Uh, basically, what happened here is that the favela was expanding upwards into the mountains. And again, you can see the dangerous uh, territories in which they're built. Uh, but the government had to create this infrastructure to make sure that the inhabitants had access to the more formal city. So the question with these projects is, how much is the government really uh, thinking about, or the government's thinking about, uh, what they're investing, how they're investing these monies, and the repercussions of uh, formalizing uh, informal dwellings. A couple more images of uh, the elevator. Um, and then um, these this decisions deal with uh, the cultural acceptance of verticality. So as before in the first example where, where we're building houses for everybody um, and giving them their own uh, piece of land, we're uh, accepting that there is a cultural adversity to verticality. When we start doing these projects, we're actually accepting that verticality has to be part of our daily lives. So two quotes here uh, that I think are very important for the future of the region. One is questioning if this acceptance of informality, it's all too easy to forget that in this acceptance of informality, it is all too easy to forget that to live informally is actually to live precariously. Uh, and also the cost that this sort of infrastructure has. So uh, regularizing informal settlements is actually 2.8 times higher than, cost, than the cost of just regular land. Uh, so the only way is up, and this is an article that we just saw in the Architectural Review, probably you all read it, uh, but it's, it's, it's very important that we start thinking about higher structures. Again, regardless if they're 5, 10, 200 uh, meters high, uh, floors high. Uh, but when you look at the region, as OMA said, uh, we have a, a lack of high-rise buildings in the area, and we need to start thinking about that. So how do I see the future of the, are, the area and what are we doing? Uh, we're trying to change the preconceptions on vertical living. Uh, for us, this new green and vertical generation of people are going to start changing uh, what they ask from the market and the real estate developers. Uh, we're going to see more older people uh, living in cities, uh, trying to regain uh, what they miss, but also uh, uh, having access to uh, hospitals and, and social, uh, social care. Uh, we are challenging with this the government budgets as pressure mounts to spend on pensions, healthcare, and social services. 
we're trying to promote denser and more efficient cities. We're also trying to promote private and public partnerships, which is also important in the developing of taller structures. And we're trying to think democratic, dem democratically about the, uh, the relationship between the horizontal and the vertical continuum. As right now, I think most of the towers, the towers that we have seen, they're ba basically a barrier on the bottom that doesn't allow the rest of the population to have access to this vertical, uh, uh, the, this verticality or this vertical living, and that for us is very important. So we've done a couple of projects in Costa Rica looking at these things. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the country, it has a lot of great things. Uh, we have the first Latin American astronaut. Uh, it was one of the first cities uh, that uh, had public light, uh, and you can all go on uh, and read, and I'm pretty sure we compete with the Philippines in terms of biodiversity. Uh, you can find, I think it's 4% of the species in the world in just this uh, little piece of land. Uh, we're also looking for 20% of the territory protected, uh, and we're trying to be the first carbon neutral country, if that is possible. The idea here is to show you that Costa Rica is known to be a green country, but the urban situation is a little bit different. And so the question becomes, how, uh, how really sustainable are we trying to be or the country is trying to be? This is the uh, capital of Costa Rica. It's located in the middle of the country. And we're looking at the great metropolitan area. And just let me show you, uh, which is basically located in this valley here. So it starts talking about those topographies that, uh, where the city grows. Uh, this is a three-dimensionality uh, of that. And this is how the city started. Uh, a couple of hundred years ago. And this is what the city has become. Uh, this is the urban sprawl that we're looking. Everybody lives in one or two story houses. Uh, and this has become dangerous for, for everybody. So um, this is what you see. This is the sprawl of the city, where there is a continuum uh, between the green, you can see the hills, uh, but also the informal or the formal. These are uh, more formal developments. And then the shanty towns, which lie in uh, different areas of the city. So it's not like we're dislocating, but we're dealing with a very complex system. This informality happens in the exterior, but also in the interior of the city, where you can see the inside of each of the properties. So one of the things that we've done is try to see where these 11% of the population that lives in informal settlements lives and how they live. Uh, and they basically take over the green areas or the unutilized areas of the city and they start giving their backs uh, to what in other countries could be actually an asset for, uh, uh, for urban living. This is a, a graphic that shows the number of uh, vehicular trips. Uh, this is the city that you saw. Uh, and there's actually 7 million daily vehicular trips. This is three trips per person in a very small area. Uh, this is a, a typical image within the city. And, uh, this is what you find uh, some of the mornings when you step out. Um, this informality uh, accounts for 30 to 40 percent of uh, the garbage not making it to landfills, uh, and it creates this really, really huge problem, this displacement. Uh, specifically in this country, uh, presidents have promised uh, in this case, 80,000 houses, but the next president wants to uh, do more, so they propose 100,000 more, and then the other one, 120, and there's a competition, and they're all expanding. And so how do we deal with this? What to do? Uh, well, we're proposing to, first of all, try to understand that it's a cultural problem. It's a problem that uh, it's, it, it's a society's problem. It's not their problem. It's not that they're living in there. Um, and so basically try to... Uh, understand that informality, horizontality, and verticality are complex systems that are together. Uh, we looked at, this, at the sizes of uh, how the uh, government divides the city to see how we can create uh, denser uh, areas within those places. Uh, and also looking at examples that are being built in other parts of the world. Uh, maybe we don't have to build this high, but creating uh, social spaces that start uh, growing and, and, and producing activities that we're not uh, producing right now. So overall, what we're trying to do is revisit those perceptions on density and verticality through sharing social participation spaces and urban interventions. And to understand that verticality is a continuum of actually that horizontality, and it's not competing against it. Um, these are some of the projects that we've designed. I'm just going to show you this very, very quick. But we took that river. We proposed a couple of vertical structures here. 
that uh, share the views, that retake the river, uh, and basically start opening a relationship between the city and the natural environment uh, and creating a, a multi-program idea of uh, the city. So for example, we were proposing a, a little indoor soccer field on the fourth floor and, uh, uh, and so on. And this starts to talk about spaces like this where you go up, you find a, a, an opening, you still leave that, uh, uh, the, the natural uh, wellness of the city, uh, and also try to look at them as generators of um, sustainable uh, new practices. So we're looking at these buildings, how do they perform, what are they to do, uh, how to build them, uh, how to really understand that this can make a change within uh, our own society. So uh, thank you very much. Luis, thanks very much for this very interesting talk about how developing countries can deal with uh, city growth and how you um, have to go almost to a re-education exercise to uh, make people understand that, um, um, that living in, in denser city centers is, uh, is, uh, is a sustainable way forward for the growth of our cities. I think I uh, encourage uh, you to take it forward and, uh, and maybe... Uh, um, maybe the, your study can also be, uh, um, can inform other developing countries on our, and, and how the structure of the city could be, could be uh, revisited. Okay, um, our next speaker.